All right, we're back. It is Comp 1004, and it's uh, Rapid Application Development Fall 2016 semester at Georgian, and it's week one, part two of our broadcast. Um, so we finished talking about basic, basic program we made. Uh, do I need you to do this? It's just an overview. I want you to understand the, the basic syntax of C Sharp. Again, it's a C influence language. It's not going to shock you what it can do. And I want you to understand the Visual Studio Editor or the IDE. Again, there's this main solution window. Um, again, if you don't have the Solution Explorer window, you can go to View. <laughs> Under View, you can see that there's a Solution Explorer. If you lose it somehow, you can put it, you know, kind of put them back by going through these, um, <clears throat> these little links. Let's open up a new project. So I'm going to do one more, a new project again. And this time, we're going to create a project that uses GitHub. Because remember, this our, our lab uses GitHub, and we want to create um, our Git repo. Now, there's a couple tricks. Before I leave this, one thing I want to show you is under Tools, when you install Visual Studio 2015 Enterpri Enterprise with Update 3, um, I want you to go to Tools, and I want you to go to Extensions and Updates. And I want you to make sure you have the following extensions. All right? So it's not just about downloading tools. These are the ones that I have installed. Um, if you're doing web stuff, this would be a nice one. But we don't need that for this course, the Bootstrap Snippet Pack. I use that a lot for uh, web development. But uh, if I skim down here to show you what, I, what I, I definitely want, I definitely want you to use this GitHub extension from Visual Studio. So if it doesn't come if, with your installation, and it should if you install everything, 39 gigabytes, come on, man. You can do it. You can get an external drive. Install everything. You'll be fine. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So if you do that, and if you download, uh, it may include the GitHub extension for Visual Studio or not. And if it doesn't, please go to Tools, Extensions and Updates, search for GitHub extension for Visual Studio uh, on the online portion. So click Online. And if I type in Git, right, then I'm going to get this GitHub extension for Visual Studio. It's just further down here. Notice that the, created, the creator is GitHub. So I know that it's an official extension. Right? I want you to install this one for sure. There are others that we're going to install later on, but this would definitely be a requirement uh, for this course. You can do the terminal too if you want to, but I'm going to show you how to do it all within the Visual Studio Editor, so you don't have to even go to terminal at all. If you're used to doing terminal, you're way ahead. You're miles ahead of most people, believe it or not. Right? And it's OK. If you want to do Visual Studio, um, if you want to use GitHub without using Visual Studio interface, you're free to do that. I don't care how it gets to GitHub. I just want to see your GitHub. Uh, your GitHub link. OK, so once you've installed that, I'm going to create a new, uh, I'm going to create a new uh, project. So I'm going to go File, New, Project. And this time, instead of doing a console app, it was just for demonstration purposes. We're not going to do another console app pretty much for the rest of the course. That was just it, just to show you, hey, this is what a console app looks like. I want to make a program. Here's a class. Uh, it's a very simple thing. Let's go into the Windows Form application now. And I want to make my project. And I want you to use this project when you're watching the video, or if you're doing it live now, for your lab. Right? So we're going to do comp 1004. And it's going to be, again, fall 2016. And then it's going to be lesson 1b. So lesson 1b, you can also call it lab 1 if you want to. Um, this is what we're going to do with lab 1. Notice that I have my create directory for solution in, uh, checked, as well as create new Git repository checked. It also might be add to source control, and if, if you haven't done Git before. Click OK. What this is going to do is it's going to open up a brand new application. Now, I have a couple of things here when it comes to Windows Forms application. One is I have this design aspect. Okay, So there's different uh, um, you know, um, ways of designing my application. One of them is, and the most common way is, using the Visual Designer, which is this. By the way. When we do Visual Studio, Visual Studio uh, stuff for web applications, nowadays, we don't use the Visual Designer. We have it available to us with ASP.NET. And if you're going to take Comp 2007, it's available to you. However, we don't use it. Why? Because what you see is not what you get typically with the web. There, and web keeps changing so often. Um, we've kind of gone kind of away from that, we, even if you're going to make a, a, a web forms application. But here with Windows Forms, we definitely do use the designer. Why? Because we can design the way the application is going to look like before we launch it. Right? So notice that we have a window here. That's our form. 
And on the right, we have our CS file, which is our class. We just talked about classes, right? We also have our program.cs file. That's our driver class. And if I double click on our program.cs file, you're going to see similarities to what we had before. You're going to have a static main. And it uses this application class right, to run my new form, my form one. Now, form one is a very poor name for our form. Let's just call this one the start form. But in order for us to do that, we have to rename our form from form one to startform.cs. So I'm going to right click on my form. I'm going to click rename. And I'm going to call this start form. You can call it whatever you like. That makes sense in your application, startform.cs. Now it's going to ask you, hey, Tom, do you want to refactor across the entire application the name startform.cs? And the smart thing to answer is yes. If you say no, you're going to have to hand bomb all the changes. Please don't say no when you, re when you rename the form. Click yes. And notice that now, even in our program.cs file, it's renamed it to start form. That's the form that starts off, yes. Like right here? You could do all kinds of stuff, yes. But I'm saying you might have the one thing that uh, Visual Studio might ask you to do is, hey, do you want to propagate these changes? Again, if you say no, then you have to hand bomb all the changes, right? But yes, it will allow you to change things, right? You can also change it right here. If I if if I go down here and change this from start form to something else, it would work, but it it, it wouldn't launch your form. Right, and that's why that's why Visual Studio is superior. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, it's because Visual Studio, again, Visual Studio is a monster, right? It has, it's, it's, it's packed with stuff. It gives you a lot of really cool things, but it's a monster. It's a, it's a beast, right? So because it's a beast, it gives you lots of really cool functionality, but it's fat. It's like a really fat beast, right? Um, and that's why we use something like Visual Studio Code or Atom or something else when it comes to web design if we're going to do something simple and not, vis and not with something with Microsoft. But here with Windows Forms, it behooves us to use Visual Studio. And let me show you this. So I've got my window form. It's called start form. I'm going to expand it. You can see I have control over expanding how big the form will be. And if I just run it like this, if I just click start now, so I'm going to click start. And it's asked me to save, which is unusual. Let's just save everything, and then I'll start. Come on. Save everything, and then I'll, um, I'm going to debug. Start debugging is what I want, right? Shouldn't ask me to do that. There we go. What it does is it creates my window. So there's my window. Now, yes. Very close. But I would ask you not to use Visual Basic. Visual Basic is, um, you know, the the dumb little brother of C Sharp. Yes. Right. Not that I'm saying that it's, uh, you know, <laughs> you can't use it. And a lot of people still use Visual Basic to create web app, uh, or sorry, Windows uh, applications. It's very similar. So because it's used the same common language runtime, which we're going to talk about, right? And the same uh, data, uh, the same common data types and everything else, it uses those two things. So if you know data types in C Sharp, you know data types in, um, in Visual Basic, and you know data types in C++. It's all the same, and, and F Sharp as well, right? So all those things are the same. And that's why uh, Microsoft is a very successful platform, .NET. OK, so you can create a simple form like that. Well, we also have a toolbox, right? And one of the things you're going to notice is that there's, there are several controls. That's what we're, we're going to add in. A couple things I want you to note. The form itself is a class. It's being instantiated. It's being instantiated when I call from the program uh, class itself. The program class itself calls a new instance, anonymous instance, of the start form class right here. And I'll show you that. That's what it does. So it's actually in instantiating a new anonymous instance of the start form class. That's what it's doing in the program. So my program is the driver class that kicks off my form, right? That's what it does. However, automatically, um, there's a couple things to note. When we look at the form itself, so here's my start form. Here's the design side. If I go to my solution explorer, if I kind of click down on the arrow, you can also see that the form itself, right? It's the wrong one. The form itself has the um, I can go into the code side, and I can do that with F7, or I can click on View Code. The code side looks like a, a class, like we saw earlier, right? But here's the difference. Notice that the keyword partial is being used. In C Sharp, 
we can create partial classes, right? Now, it's cap you're also capable of doing that in other languages. But what that means is we can define the blueprint for the class across different files. What that helps us out with is it allows us to make a very big class uh, you know, split across different files for different methodologies or different methods, let's say. If I have, maybe I want to have different methods, a set of methods on this file, and I want to just look at those methods because I have a massive class that I'm creating, right? I can use partial class, the keyword partial, to create this, uh, the class in its entirety across different files in the same namespace, okay? Here, what it does for us is it hides the design uh, details inside the other file. So here are the two files, the designer.cs file. If I double click on that, you can see again, here's my class, start form, right? And notice that it, it's hiding all the details, all the, uh, the details for my form itself. This is the actual form for my, uh, my start form, right? So for example, the name of the form, this is the property, which is start form. The text, uh, the property of uh, the text property of the form, which is form one, is what appears uh, on the title bar, right, of the form, okay? So again, it's split up into, into, into partial classes. Are we gonna be talking about partial classes, uh, you know, today anymore? No, I'm just mentioning it to you, so if you see it, don't freak out and say, what's partial mean, right? Tom didn't talk about partial, something's wrong, nothing's wrong, right? C Sharp has split up web form so that it, it, it kind of defines the form across different files, that's all it does. The one we care about is startform.cs, this one, and this is the one we're going to be playing around with over the next few weeks. OK, one thing is I want to turn on or show my properties window. If you don't have access to the properties window, you can always get it by going to view. And then if you go to properties, and I believe sometimes it's under, under other windows, and it is, I probably missed it. <clears throat> it is under. Properties down here, F4. If you click F4, it'll bring up the properties window if you're missing it. Now, typically you have it when you create your project, but sometimes if you get rid of it by accident, you want to get it back, right? So what the properties windows does is it allows us to, it's context sensitive. So whatever I'm clicking on, it gives me all the properties, attributes, if you will, of the object. So my form has a bunch of properties. For example, the title, now the name of the, of the form itself is form one right now, which is pretty ugly. Let's change that by going to the text property and changing this to start form. And you can put whatever string you want in there. Right? Press enter. I'm going to ask you to, to uh, for a, as a convention, whenever we add a control onto a form, I want you to use the control name in the, in the name when we name the, the control. An example would be I'm adding a button. And I'm going to call it, in, in a second, I'm going to call it the click me button. I'm going to name it click me button. It's really long. And some people complain, can I use BTN? Please don't use BTN. Use button because you're learning this for the first time, right? Not because I don't understand what BTN means, right? But because I want everyone to have to share the exact same uh, methodology when creating their variables. Why? I want you to picture this as a big coding house. We're in a development uh, house. I'm the owner, and I'm giving you the rules, right? And that's how it actually happens. If you actually work for somebody else, look at your rules for how to code and how to do stuff. Chances are. Right? They might give you a style, a style guide about how to create your variables and everything else and how to, and how to comment your variables as well uh, or comment your, your code. So for, my, for us, we're going to use that methodology. The book actually used BTN and they use short forms. But for what I, ask, what I want you to do, I want you to use the full name. All right, so we got our form. Um, what I want to do is I want to drag and drop a couple of controls. Let's look at common controls here. A label. Here's my control. Here's my label. And I want to drag and drop a button on the form. Here's my button. Yay, a button. All right, cool. Um, if I click on the label, notice that the properties, the context for the properties changes. If I click on the button, same thing. So there's a change to the, to the, to the properties because of what I'm clicking on. Um, so what I want to do is I want to make this button so that it says, click me. Well, first of all, I want to rename this button because by default it becomes, the name of the button is button one which is pretty ugly and non-descriptive. So let's call this click me button. So click, uh, click me button, right? There we go. And then, of course, maybe some on the, in the text property, let's change the text property to click me, right? There we go. And if it doesn't fit, you can use the handles on the control to expand the control so that it fits. 
Very, very simple. Here's my label, right? My label just says label right now, right? We're not going to change that. We're not going to change the text of the label, but I do want to change the label name, and we'll just call this to message label. So we'll call this message label. There we go. Whenever I click on the click me button, this is what I want to do. I want the message label to change, OK? That's what I want. And then I want to upload all this up to GitHub in a second, too. So first of all, I've got a couple things here. I've created my application, right, as an example. Let's save all, and let's test it to see if my user interface looks OK. I'm going to press the Start button. And there we go. I've got my Click Me button. doesn't do anything yet. And my label. Notice that my gesture, though, in my testing on, under the, because I've, I've clicked Run with Debugging, right? Every time I click the Click Me button, oops, actually on the form, here it is, on the form, Every time I click the click me button, I can see that the gesture is being recognized by the debugger, right? So I can see that the click me button, the event listener, I'm listening for the click. As soon as I create a control, I want you to think of a control as an object that I'm instantiating. These controls are all objects you know, uh, uh, that have been pre-created for us. We can also make our own custom controls. And we may get to that later on. All right, so that's what this does. So we've created our user interface. This is a great place to put it up on GitHub, right? How do I do that here in Visual Studio? I need to go to the Team Explorer window. If you don't have Team Explorer, you got to go to View, View, Team Explorer, all right? Bring up that Team Explorer window. So here it is. I'm going to pin this up for a second. Under my, my Team Explorer, right? And again, I'm going to show you what this looks like in a little bit bigger here. Under Team Explorer, you see a couple things. I have changes and branches and sync and settings. Let's go to changes for a second. If you notice, I've got a bunch of changes. These are all the things that I've changed in my code since I created my, my Git repository, this local. Remember, when I created my project, I clicked on Git, add to Git, right? And automatically created a local repository. A repository is a folder that's invisible. And if I was going to show you where that is, let's look at Solution Explorer for a second. And if I right click on my project and I scroll down, you can see that I can open my folder in my file explorer, right? And if I go up a level to my containing folder, I see that there's a hidden .git file or folder, right? Again, you can only see this as if, if, you, if you're showing hidden files and folders. And you can do that by going to Windows and changing your settings in Control Panel, right? This git folder is where all the changes are being recorded, right? That's what's happening. OK, and it, and it happened automatically. My .git folder was created when I created my project, OK? Now I want to go back to Team Explorer, and I want to I want to create a commit message that kind of names the snapshot that I'm going to take here. So this is all the changes I want to make. I want to create a snapshot for my code. I'm going to call this added, you know, kind of label and click me button, right? And click commit all. Now I've got my this this commit that I just made is a local commit. But notice I've got three commits that I haven't put published right now. They're just local to my system. Again, when we use Git and GitHub, Git is the, re the repository system that we use in locally on my machine, right? GitHub is a service that's provided on the cloud. And what we want to do is take our local Git repository and push the contents to the cloud. And the way we're going to do that is we need, first of all, to have a, Git a GitHub account. So if you all did a GitHub account, I'm hoping that, hoping that you all did that by now. That's great. I'm going to go now to my Home button, and I'm going to click on Sync. And under Sync, it's going to ask me, and this is why I asked you to get Visual Studio 2015 Enterprise Edition with Update 3 and download the GitHub extension, because it will give you this option. right? If I click Get Started, it's going to say, hey, do you mean that you want to make a repository that's called Comp 1004 Fall 2016 Lesson 1B? The answer is, yes, I do. Thank you very much. Where do I want it? I don't want it for me. This is my, my basic repository. I, I have a few organizations in GitHub, right? One of my organizations is called my name, right? The other one is called Georgian. And that's the one I want to hit, right? So I want to create this repository on my Georgian College account, right? I just need to click Publish. And if everything goes well, and if you set everything up properly, then the magic happens, my friends. And when I go to GitHub, so if I want to go to GitHub now, and if I look at, uh, this is my main GitHub account, but if I look at Georgian College, and if I refresh, you can see that I have 
comp 1004, fall 2016, less than 1B. Guess what? We just finished your lap. Truly, that's all I care for. If you do one of these, and if I, if I see your files here, 2% you get, all right? I know it looks easy, but you need to set up Visual Studio 2015. You need to set up, download and install that Git um, uh, extension. I recommend that. And you need to be able to follow the steps of I just, I've just done with you. Please look at the video if you're unclear about how this happens. And you might run into some hiccups. Recording anyway, right? So when it comes back online, hopefully it didn't crap out my recording. Let's take a look. Ha! Huh, it's still broadcasting, so it says. Um, let's see what happens. Um, but anyways, you might have a hiccup in the broadcast because you just lost connectivity. But if you look here, um, you can see that I've got my this out here in the root represents my uh, my outer container, which is comp one thousand and four and so on, right? And if I click into it, you can see all the code that I just, I, I just used. I'm using the start form. And this is all the code that you need in this particular example. However, I have to you know, put a disclaimer to this. One thing that uh, Visual Studio does also automatically for you is it installs a git ignore file that ignores some files. And sometimes, especially if you have a database or something and you want to put it up on GitHub, it won't go. So you have to force it to go. And there's ways to do that. We're going to talk about that later on. But for this example, what we want, this would suffice. We're not quite done. I want to make my click me button work. Right? So how do I do that? Well, yes? Yeah, you could do that. How do, how do, I, how do I, what do I do here? To, yeah, this is my start form. On the start, on the CS form. I could do that. Yeah, yeah. But I want to click, I want to kind of click on the button and then have it happen. How do I do that? If I double click on it, if I double click on the button, this is the quick and dirty way of doing it. Double click, right? Boom! It creates a, a method for us right away. Yeah, I know you did it a long way, right? Um, if you double click on the button, it creates a method, which is the event handler, right? Again, the event listener was already there. As soon as I put the button in place, because I'm using a button, I'm already listening for gestures. Once I have that button in place, because it's a button object, I'm listening for gestures, click gestures, or whatever I'm going to put, right? Now that I, I double clicked onto it, it generates the event automatically for me. Yes. What do you put now? Oh, sure. Tell me. What do you put next? So my message label. Yes. Message label. Right. Dot text. Right. Is equal to. I don't know. Hello or you you were clicked or something. Whatever the message is going to be. Right. Yeah, let's say let's put a hello world, right? Hello world, right? Click me for hello world. Okay, there we go. So um, you're right. Uh, as long as you uh, once we set up the uh, and the most important thing, that's why I mentioned how we we set up the label. The label itself, even though it says label one in our text, um, in the properties of the label, notice that we called it. We named the label. The ID is very important. The name of the label is message label, and so therefore, when we name it this way, we can find it instead of a generic. Uh, uh, you know, name such as uh, label one. It's more descriptive to say it's the message label, right? And the text property of the label, which is the text property, is the one that we're changing, right? And inside of my my method, this this event handler, when I click this method or click the button, this this method triggers. That's what we call it. With this method triggers, and when the method triggers, it executes this command, right? And then, hello world, the text of the label is going to change to hello world. Let's check this out and see if it works. So run this thing, and I click the click me button, and all of a sudden, boom, hello world. Magic, right? Here's a problem I want to point out to you. Please don't, for whatever reason, decide to delete this method like this. This would be like, you know, here's the, the do's and don'ts. I want to delete the method. Yay, delete the method. And I go back to here, 
and now I have a problem. It won't render my design anymore. Why? Because I've deleted a method that's required. Because remember, what you see in this CS file is only part of the class. The other part of the class is somewhere else in the designer. And what it's done is it's created the event listener and the event handler, the whole delegate system and everything else on the back end. And it's looking for something that doesn't exist. And so the designer craps out. So if you want to remove a, 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 an event, if I go back to my start form, and if I, you know, um, I want to change that, I'm going to undo that. Uh -huh. Ha-ha. 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 What am I going to do now, right? Uh, because my start form does CS. If I control Z, there we go, um, is the one that I want. I'm back, right? And if I, if I actually go to my start form again, I'm good. I'm back in business, right? I'm telling you this because it's a common thing for students when they first learn web forms to delete the, you know, the thing because they, they named it wrong. I named it button one. Oh, I don't want it that. I want to delete it. And I take it out. And then suddenly your form doesn't work anymore. Yeah. The best way to rename the form is right click rename, and then it'll rename to whatever you want, right? However, the right way to do it if you want to delete it. So let's say I've got my I've got this this uh, um, event handler right here. What I want to do is if you know if you notice that if I pick up the properties, here's my properties, right? And if I click on the button, I have a couple of buttons up here. Notice there's the properties button, and there's also the events button. If I click on the events button here in the tab. Notice that I have the click me event right here. If I just delete this altogether, and if I go back to my startform.cs, now I can get rid of this. And it's not going to hurt me as long as I don't kill extra curly braces. Um, I can get rid of this, save it, and I can still go back here, and I'm OK. right? Because I killed it from here. I, I removed the dependency, which is what I put in here. Also. I double clicked here to generate the, uh, the, the code snippet or the code stub, if you will. I don't have to double click here. I can also double click here, and I can decide any kind of gesture event that I want, not just the click event. So for example, I don't know, if I do some kind of drag and drop functionality or enter, I press the enter key, or I do some kind of key down event or uh, different um, a mouse leave or a mouse enter, I can do those kinds of events as well, not just a click event. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's say I want to make it so that when I hover over the, the, the button, it changes the label to say hello world, right? Instead of double clicking. I can go over here to where it says mouse hover or mouse enter. Doesn't matter which one. Let's do mouse enter. So I'm going to double click on here. And now it creates the click me button mouse enter event, right? OK. What does this do? So if I, I can do the same thing. I can say, well, when, it, when you hover over, change the, instead of even clicking on it, I want to change the, um, the label text, message label, message label uh, text. I want to change it back to uh, <clears throat> goodbye. And I hover over it. Or actually, when, how about when I, did I put the leave or the enter? I'll change it to the leave. I'll say uh, hi. There we go. OK, good. So when I, I hover over it, it's going to say hi. And when I hover off of it, I want to say goodbye. right? So I'm going to go back to here again. And notice that I have my, uh, mouse, my mouse enter. And I can also do a mouse leave. I can do more than one event on the same control. Double click. And then I can do, here's the mouse leave event. And I'll say message label dot text is equal to goodbye. And of course, I can always do the click event, too. I can do it from here or here. Same thing. Let's do it from here. You can see how it appears automatically, right? And I can go here. And inside there, I can do them. I can copy this piece here and paste. And I can say message label.txt is equal to hello world. There we go. Oops. All right, so we have got several events for the same button. Let's, let's start this off and see what happens. And if I hover over, I get hi. If I hover out, I get goodbye. If I hover over, I get hi. If I click on it, I get hello world. If I hover out, I get goodbye. And it keeps on triggering over and over again as I do stuff. Very simple event handling. Yes. Mouse hover, um, if I'm not wrong, it's, a, it's very similar. But I think if you do mouse enter, you're able to, well, let's, check, let's check it out. It's a good question. It does, there's a slight difference in one from the other. 
And I think there's a reason in, in it's, um, and when it triggers the event. Let's try this out. So if I do mouse hover, let's see if we're, what we do. We get for me, and it's a very simple thing to test. If I go to mouse, mouse hover, double click, and I can, let's do another, another uh, something else. We'll say something like, uh, yo, there we go, yo, for mouse hover. All right, so if I run this thing, and I think it's if you stay over it. When you enter, you ha it happens, but when you stay over it, it's mouse hover. All right, so if I enter, see how I did it? Leave, but if I enter it, it goes kind of yo, a high yo, right? Because both events, you entered it, and plus you're hovering. So both events are triggering, yeah. Like you have is a click. Uh-huh. Yeah. Can you have more than one event fired from that? Or yeah, you have to have one event that will call upon. My boy, you can call any other method from the one event. So I can make my own independent methods, right? But you can only assign it one event. You can no, that one event will only trigger all these these events are the main events that I showed you. The main event, right? Um however, you can trigger as many methods as you want from that event. So that event can split off and Call five different methods, right? If that makes sense, right? Um, you can also share event handlers. I can have two buttons and they use the same event, right? Why? Because I can point to it instead of clicking on it. And what I mean by that is if you go through, we're going to talk about events in more detail, but if you notice there's a pull down, I can click on any, one of, any, any of the events. So if I have other buttons that I want to do the exact same thing on, I have button number one, button number two, button number three. But every time something something happens when you enter the enter the button, it says hi or something like that. For any button, you can just choose the uh, mouse uh, mouse enter event, the click me button mouse enter event. And maybe you could even rename this thing so it just says button mouse uh, you know uh, mouse enter event. You can make your own custom name for it. You don't have to accept the name that they give you. It generates the name based on the name of the control. Okay, questions. All right, I know it's a lot, but the reason why I'm giving you this stuff is so that way you've seen it one time. We're going to review it again and again. It's not the last time we're going to see it. Again, it's just an overview today about how Windows Forms are made. And I want you to imagine all the things you can possibly do with Windows Forms just by what I've shown you. If you know a button and a label, damn, you can create a whole game with it, right? That's all you need with a button and a label. I can make a whole slot machine with a button and a label, right? Um, yes? <laughs> Key down over here? Just, uh, yes, key down, right? If you do a key down, then what you can do is you can check for what the key down is. So what you're going to look is what key is being pressed, a key press event. You're going to get a, a key down will fire multiple, any key will trigger that event, any key, yeah. right? But be careful because for you to get the key down event, that a control has to be active. It has to be um, the blur. It can't be, uh, the blur can't be off of it. It has to be actually active. So that the, um, the focus, sorry, the focus has to be on that control. If the focus is not on that control, your key down event will never trigger. Okay, makes sense? All right, and I mean, again, from a focus perspective, what do I mean by that? Um, example, the label, if I run this code again, right? Right now, if I, if I click onto the label, my label has focus, believe it or not. I can't see it. If I click onto this now, right, if I actually click on, if I hold it down, my Control has focus. My click event has focus right now because I'm clicked onto it. I can also tab to it, right? My tab, my control has focus to it right now, right? Because I've tabbed to it. It'll, there's a tab order uh, in the control as well. And if I press enter, it'll also do it trigger the event, right? Because enter will click, trigger the click event, right? So there's many ways. We're going to talk about events and details. I just want to give you a very high overview. You guys are asking lots of good questions, and I'll answer them. One thing I really don't like is the fact that, uh, and I'll finish this off by this, I don't like the fact that the text is really small, right? I think that text is too small for me. So let's make some really quick changes to the form to make it a little bit more sexy, right? Because I think the text, well, and you, you, know, you might not agree with me, but hey. Um, let's see how we're going to do this. There's a couple ways to do this. I can, I can change the font and the, the size of the font and the type of font and the color of the fonts and all that stuff um, for each control by hand, or if I click on the, on the form itself, and if I go to font, right, I can certainly click on this, look at the ellipses on the font itself, and then I can choose a different kind of font. For example, let's say I want to use 
something else, right? Like Lucida Sands or something like that, if I have something like that, which mostly I will. Right here's my Lucida Sands. And let's say I want to make it, I don't know, something crazy like 20. Now, this is going to really change my form. In fact, it's going to have a really crazy effect on my form. Let's take a look. First, OK, bam. Let's make my form massive, right? Why? Because I'm changing the font for my entire form, and all the controls are scaling to fit my, the sizes now. Now, this is OK. This is what I wanted. But I didn't want the form to be so big. And of course, the shortcut would be to just make the form smaller and move the buttons around or the, or the controls around uh, you know, to the way I want. This is a kind of a quick and dirty way of changing all the controls so that they, they adhere to the same uh, font uh, you know, style. And if I want to make colors and so on, I can do that as well. I can also blank up this text. I'm leaving it as label one, but I don't need to. Sometimes we leave it there from a, a placement perspective. Like For example, I want my label to start on this corner, and I want it to you know, kind of go left to right. If I put it here, and if my, my hello world would kind of be, would look kind of off, right? But if I did this, and notice I can't size my label. My, my label gets sized automatically, right? But there are different things we can do. Like, for example, I could decide to make my label not size automatically. And we can do that later on. OK. So here's my form now. And you know what I also don't like? I don't like the fact that when I run my form, um, it starts off on the top. Ooh, it's massive, right? It's massive, right? Why is it so big? It's so big because I scaled my entire form to fit the Sans 20 point, right? 20 point. OK? I'm just going to show you that, that you can do that. Let's go back to 12. So it scales the entire form. And if I run it again, you can see that um, it'll scale my form to 12 points, right? If I click on the button, right? If I hover over it or off it, you can see that. If I want to hide my label, so I don't want to show that, I can certainly, once I place it, I can certainly get rid of the text altogether so it doesn't show anything when I first run it. I can do that as well. There it is. And if I click onto it, I can see what, it, what I get or hover over it. Um, the other thing is if I want to reposition my form to a different place in the screen, I can certainly do that by choosing the form itself and going down to start position. I don't want my default location. Maybe I want it to go center screen. I'm going to ask you to do that a bunch of times. And I'm going to click start. So I can start in the middle. Make sense? So the form itself is an object. Each control is an object. And every form or control has properties. I want you to take that away from today. And that'll definitely be on a, on a quiz next week. You know? um, any questions for what we've done so far? Here's something else. Here's what I don't like. I don't like this. I can resize my form all over the place, right? This is no good. It means I can kind of make it so that it looks like this, right? My application will look kind of weird if I can just do one of these, right? I don't want that. So how do I stop that from happening? Of course, you can do that. There's something called a um, form border style. This is from the form itself. Right now, the form border style is sizable. I can also change this to fixed single, right? Fixed single. And now when I run this thing, I don't have my handle. My handles don't come up for sizing. I can't resize my form anymore. Yes? This full screen no borders? Like you're talking about like this? There's all kinds of things you can do with it. I mean, it's it's got the same the window that we've, we're creating here is the same controls that we would have for any other window that we make, right? Now, if I want to stop that from happening, I can also go and stop that as well. I can go back. You have full control, right? So there's something called the control box. These are good questions. The control box is true, right? Um, I can enable or disable the control box. I can also enable or disable maximize or minimize, right? So for example, my maximize box, if I want to disable that, I can do that, right? And now when I run this thing, you won't be able to maximize it anymore. It's disabled, right? There's many things you can do here, lots of control. And you can do it both on the design side or on the program side, on the code side. So I can code it. Uh, when the when the when the application runs, yes. So you just uh, hide the title bar so that nothing there. Yes. I guess why would you do that? Because you might want to. You may want to make a splash screen. So there's. Do you want to make a form? 
that's a splash screen, so it doesn't have a title bar whatsoever. It just comes up and then disappears after a certain time. We're going to do all these things together, right? Um, but if you want to take away the title bar, that's not that's not no problem. We just take away the control box altogether. So here's our control box. We just make this false, and I can see that that's gone for the control box. We also can take away the title itself, right? And I gotta wait for this to update for a second. Um, so if you look at the um, uh, the main menu strip, the maximize box, all that's gone. Minimize the minimum size. If I want, I, I can specify a minimum size for the the actual object as well. A start position. Let me see if I can do this for you. Um, I think it's the um, form border size, form border style again. Form border style is fixed single. I can make it so that it's none. There we go. And then if I click play, you can see that I have a form. It's there, but there's no, there's nothing. There's no borders, and there's also no control box, right? The only way, of course, I could shut this down is if I click the stop button, or if you really care. I can create another button. No, then we'll stop here because we're kind of. I gotta talk about other things. Um, I can go to my toolbox and I can. I can uh, actually. I, let me just copy and paste. I can also copy and paste items like this. I copy copy the button and paste it, and I can kind of drag it over on the side, right? I've got what looks like two click me buttons, but we'll make one an exit. So all I have to do is change the name of the button because the name gets automatically changed to button. I can change the name of the button to exit button. And we can also go, go down to the bottom and change this from click me to exit. Now, it does not have uh, automatically any events mapped out to it, if you notice. I'm clicking the event button here in the tabs. But I can certainly add its own event by double clicking, right? And I, can, I, can, I, wanna, I want to stop the application. Listen to what I'm saying. This is how easy it is. I want to exit the application. So what I'm going to do, application, oops. Application dot exit. Then that would uh, exit the application. So if I want to run this thing now, I don't need a control box like I have. I can see that the click me button works. And if I click exit, bam, I've done. My application exits, right? So again, we've handled a bunch of stuff here. It's very simple. Like when you look at this window stuff, it, it's, it, when you, it's so simple that right now you could build any application you want for Windows, even with the stuff I've shown you. If you really think about it and, and search around a little bit, it's not going to take you, it's not rocket science for you to build what I'm asking you to build. The challenge is going to be I'm going to give you specific things to build with it, right? And then you're going to have to see if you can stretch yourself to build the things that I've asked you to build, which is really what you're going to get in a work environment. Yes. Yes, with Xamarin. That's why I asked you to install 39, 39 gigs. Right? The answer is yes. Yes, you can. You can make uh, applications for Android and iOS with Visual Studio with Xamarin. It's actually uh, the history is Visual Studio or Microsoft bought Xamarin, and Xamarin uh, was we're, we're kind of creating a cross-platform or hybrid applications with C Sharp on the back end, so you don't have to write any Java or Swift code as long as you have a Mac. And I'm sorry for that, but as long as you have a Mac, then you can build an iOS uh, application as well. Right, so uh, with using Visual Studio, and the great thing if we're virtualizing, like we're the, our Mac users in the room, if you're virtualizing Visual Studio and you have a Mac, you literally can run a simulator from Visual Studio on your Mac. You'll actually run the simulator in Xcode. Right, so it's really really cool building uh, cross-platform applications. You get to go. You're, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. All right, you're awesome. Okay, so. Um, so this part of the demo is done, but let's let's finish it off by uh, going to Team Explorer and doing another commit. We did one commit, but we did a bunch of other changes. Um, you know, typically what I normally do is I every time I make a change, I add a commit. Next week we're going to go into more detail with GitHub. Today is just make a GitHub account and put stuff up on GitHub. Next week we're going to do more and more and more until you become all GitHub geniuses and you can do merging. Um, you can do things like uh, we're going to use issue tracking. Uh, creating milestones with GitHub. We're going to do things like pull requests, um, all kinds of stuff with GitHub so you become uh, really comfortable with GitHub. So you can use GitHub like it should be used. For now, we're just going to say updated project <laughs> and click commit all. And then we're going to click home, and I'm going to go to sync and then push. And what this is going to do is going to push the changes from our local repository to the remote cloud. And when I do that, if I go to 
uh, here's our, our repository, you can see that now I have, if I click on code, you can see that I have four commits, right? And each of the commits is all the stuff we've done. We added a label and, and a click me button, and now we just updated the project a few minutes, a few seconds ago. Um, and we have a full, you know, kind of uh, a narrative of all of our commits right here. Okay? So in a nutshell, this is the way we do things. Yes? It's not my fault, I swear. Because where you probably didn't, you probably missed where the installation uh, um, target is. You have to choose the installation target. You probably missed that when you were installing it, and that's why I installed it where I installed it. I recommend you on it. Well, I'm not going to re recommend anything at this point because if I if I tell you to uninstall it, you're going to kill me, right? <laughs> if I tell you you get to install it again, you're going to kill me, right? Either way, I don't know. You're going to be mad, right? Huh? I recommend that you reinstall it on an external hard drive and be careful when you install it again. Don't just choose where, wherever it tells you. Choose you make make uh, be specific about where you want it to install Visual Studio. Okay, um, so we've got our GitHub done. This is all you need again for Lab One. All you need is you know from Visual Studio to GitHub. Worst case scenario, if you can't do Visual Studio or GitHub, you can always use command line tools to do the same thing. So if you're if you still struggle with with uh, with Visual Studio and GitHub. And if you're good with command line, or if you want to look up online, there's lots of tutorials on how to do this. It's not that difficult. If you follow what I've done, and if you download Visual Studio 2015 Update 3 and the GitHub extension, you'll be fine. I highly recommend that. But um, um, that's one thing we should try and, and stick to, the same stuff. All right, so we covered this, that we, we do Windows apps. If you notice, there's only 12 uh, slides here. We covered the ability for us to what each of the objects are, like radio buttons and labels and text boxes and buttons. These are all the things that we're going to be building when we build web applications, or sorry, Windows applications. <coughs> we can also do things like ASP.NET Web Forms and ASP.NET MVC, as well as WPF, right? Again, we won't, have, we won't be covering anything to do with web in this course. We're covering that in Comp 2007. And we won't be covering WPF, even though I, re I really think it's the most modern way of doing things especially with um, Universal Windows Platform. They also use XAML, which is a way of, of creating uh, Windows applications with an XML-type format. Um, the four languages, if I was going to ask you on a test intent, what are the four languages that are, that are you know, covered with Visual Studio and the .NET language or .NET framework? It's Visual Basic, Visual C Sharp, C++, and F Sharp. All right, those are the ones. It's right here in the PowerPoint. And if you're going to have access to the PowerPoint. So this is where you would look to get full marks for that particular question, right? I'm just telling you. Um, and the reason for that is because, I mean, so we have the Visual Studio environment allows us to program in different languages. Also, it, it also comes with, when you install Visual Studio, it also installs SQL Server 2014 Express local DB, which we will be using later on in this course, OK? So that's kind of a, um, a couple things that it allows us to do. Further down. The things we talked about is, and you were asking about VB. I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know your name. Logan. Logan, right? Logan. Uh, sorry, you were you were up here too, and I, I see how I'm, I'm brain dead. Um, so you know the the common runtime or common language uh, runtime, the CLR, if you will, runs across all programming languages. So does the common type system. Those are the two things you need to know. So. If I program in VB or in C Sharp or C++, like I said, as a review, the same typing system, the same classes and objects are available to us across different programming languages. So you can program across different languages if you need to. It's not that difficult of a jump, like, just like you figured out. I mean, it's not, that, it's not like rocket science to figure out how it works. This is a little neat diagram to show you how it works, where you have your operating system hardware right at the bottom. You have your common language runtime here, your CLR. On top of that, you have your .NET framework, your class libraries, so Windows Forms, ASP.NET, and other things. And then on the top, you have your different languages that you're going to be using. It's kind of a neat little system. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, this, uh, this slide. This is cool. I mean, this kind of tells you how a C Sharp application is compiled and run. Um, again, I have a solution. We've shown you that already. Inside my solution, I have a project 
or projects. I can have more than one project, right? Each project will contain several classes, and also they could contain several folders. Each folder could represent a different namespace, right? So I could partition or uh, you know structure my files so that uh, they are structured in a way that is very organized, right? When I compile everything, what happens is um, the IDE compiles my code, right, and then assembles it automatically, and then delivers it in a runnable state. Okay, so we actually create an executable file right now. If you wanted to go back to C sharp. And if I was going to look at my Solution Explorer, one thing is I can also th do things like uh, show all files. There's some hidden files here that we don't see in Solution Explorer. One of them is this bin file. Underneath the bin file under debug, you can see that there's an executable file that we actually generated. If you take this executable file um, and drop it into your friend's machine and double click onto it, as long as they have of, uh, Windows 10, and I'm using in this course. OK. The last two slides are just the places to remind me when to do the demo. I did a tour of the ID. And of course, how to test a project. We did that already when I, when I showed you how to debug. There's two ways of debugging. One way is to start with debugging, and one was to start without debugging. Both do build and compile the project, though. right? So it's not like they don't build or compile. If you get errors, it'll, it'll tell you that there's errors. So for example, if I go back to my start form.cs. And let's say, for example, I forget a semicolon, right? It's an error, right? If I save, you can see that I get this little underline. But maybe I missed that, and I want to run. If I press Control F5, run without debugging, it's going to say, Matt, there are, there are build errors. It won't allow you to build. It won't allow you to run. You could decide to continue and run the last successful build. You could do that. You can click No. And if you click No, it's going to tell you exactly where the error is, right? So line 42 of your um, startform.cs. Here's line 42. You can see that it's pointing. This little underline is pointing to there. And it tells you what it expects. It expects a semicolon. All right? So really, debugging and error handling is, is, is pretty easy. That's it for me today. I wanted to talk about that. I want to talk about GitHub in a very high level. And so you, we kind of covered, let me, as a review, we covered C Sharp, right? How do I, use, how do I create a C Sharp uh, program, a very basic one, even with a console application? Uh, by using um, Visual Studio, right? Then we built a Windows app, and we use several different controls, buttons and labels, to create a simple application. Talked about properties and naming conventions. Lots of stuff we covered today, right? So if I was going to ask you on a test, these are all for, for a game. What's the naming convention when I add, add a control? It'd be the control name. For example, click me button. Button is the type of control. This is the convention we're using in class. I may ask that question. I may ask, ask, also ask if I'm, I'm creating private uh, variable names, I'm going to use the underscore in my class, because I mentioned that. I'm also going to ask you to use the this keyword, even if it's not required. All right? These are things that we covered throughout the course. Please use my slides when you're doing the quiz, all right? worst case scenario. Or if you're worst case scenario, if you really want to, you can always fast forward my little chit chat on the video on YouTube, and you get all the information from there. At the end of the day, it's not that you can remember by heart to do the quiz. It's that it's going through your brain a couple of times, all right, so that you get the concepts when we come to class and ask you to do something, you can do it. OK, that's what it's about. Questions? Thank you so much, guys. Remember that the Lab 1 is due tomorrow night at midnight. And all you have to do is put it up on GitHub. Go through this little thing I just showed you here on the video. Follow the video. Put Lesson 1 on GitHub, exactly how I do this little click me buttons, and you're good to go. OK, and please submit your link to GitHub uh, within, in, in the submission, all right? So don't send me an email, all right? Don't do that. Please use the Lab 1 uh, uh, you know, submission area there to uh, submit your details. Just one second. And then 